Hi everyone, thank you for joining today's webinar, Seasonal Effects and Other Anomalies with Petra Bakasova. As always, today's webinar is being recorded and will be shared on Quantopian within the next few days. After the presentation, we will hold a short Q&A session, so if you have a question, please submit it in the text box on the GoToWebinar window. Our speaker today is Petra Bakasova. She is the Chief Operating Officer at Hull Tactical and her background is in algorithmic trading across multiple asset classes, mathematical modeling, and risk management. She joined Hull Investments in 2014 and worked on projects for its proprietary trading firm, Ketchum Trading, before transferring to its quantitative asset management unit, Hull Tactical. Petra has helped shape the face and direction of Hull Tact Tactical prior to and since the launch of its first public product and continues to perform research on a number of Hull Tactical strategies. Petra began her career in quantitative finance at Arb House as the company's first strategist. Her expertise in high-frequency algorithmic market making proved to be a valuable precursor to the systematic quantitative approach sought after at Hull Tactical. Prior to Hull Investments, she cut her teeth on stock market modeling during her tenure as a quantitative researcher at Toji Trading Group. Petra holds a Master of Science degree in financial mathematics from the University of Chicago, and she pursued her undergraduate studies in applied mathematics at the Comenius University in Bratislava, Slovakia, and Halmstead University in Halmstead, Sweden. Petra will also be at this year's QuantCon in New York City on April 28th, conducting a different talk, Return Predictability and Market Timing, a one-month model. And you can read about her talk and the conference at QuantCon.com. Thanks, Petra. Thank you for the introduction, Paige. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. Um, um, so let me begin by giving you a brief background on uh, our company and, and give you a little bit of motivation behind this paper. I work for the company called Whole Tactical, and we specialize in building predictive models for U.S. equity markets. Uh, up to to this date, we published two papers on market timing, and, and this is our working paper, um, and uh, this is going to be our third paper. Uh, the difference between the first two papers and this paper is the first two papers focused on the more traditional uh, market timing models. We were building predictive models forecasting equity risk premium. Uh, on one month and six month horizon. And this paper is a little bit different. In this paper, we built some simple deterministic models and some simple forecasting models using some of the most well-known anomalies. The reason why we wanted to touch the anomalies was because a lot of the li academic literature regarding market timing actually deals with different anomalies. So we thought it would be appropriate to comment on, on this topic from a practitioner's standpoint. My plan for today is to organize this presentation into three parts. Uh, first, I will talk about the individual anomalies. I will briefly review what they are and what are some of the more popular explanations behind their existence. In the second part, I will discuss building simple trading strategies and comment on their performance. The third part of this presentation will deal with combining the individual strategies into you know, a more uh, robust strategy. Uh, and then in the very last part of the paper, I will actually go back to our original two papers and make some comments about potential of combining two or three of, of these models into an ensemble of models. And so this is the abstract of our working paper. Um, as you can see, we will talk about three different types of anomalies. We will talk about seasonal effects, trends, and pre-announcement drifts. As you can see, uh, this paper, just like our previous work, focuses on aggregate S&P 500 returns. So this will be slightly different than maybe some of the anomalies you are familiar with that deal with single stock anomalies. So everything we talk about will be with regard to the aggregate S&P 500 returns. Our data set goes back to 1960. Uh, we used the first few years to build the, uh, the initial samples for, for our models. 
and then we start building models in 1970 and start combining the models in 1975. So without further ado, let's jump right in. Um, so I'm sure most of you are familiar with most of these or all of these anomalies, but just to make sure we are all on the same page, I will review um, each of these. So the first group of anomalies are the so-called seasonal effects. Um, so turn of the month is a well-known anomaly. It's been observed that markets uh, display abnormal excess returns at the end of the month, either the last day of the month or the last few days of every month and the first few days of the next month. The most popular and well-accepted explanations behind uh, the turn of the month effect um, would be a, uh, a liquidity explanation. So in the Dash for Cash paper, uh, the authors explain that a lot of large institutions uh, make significant transfers uh, that cl are clustered around the end of the month, such as salary payments, 401k contributions, pension contributions, et cetera. And, and all these uh, transfers create systemic liquidity demand around the turn of the month, which would explain um, uh, this excess return. An alternative explanation is, is more of a behavioral explanation. Uh, it's been suggested that managers have a motivation and a tendency to announce good news as, as soon as they get them, but they tend to postpone any bad news as far as they can, which is typically end of the month or end of the quarter. Uh, the second anomaly we'll be discussing today is the sell in May, and I chuckled a little bit because the name is a little bit misleading, and I will tell you why, but sell in May is also known as the Halloween effect. And, uh, People use sell in May or Halloween effect, depending on uh, what explanation they're gonna use. But in general, what this effect uh, observes is that markets tend to have lower returns during summer months and uh, higher returns during winter months. So people who like to call this effect sell in May uh, usually subscribe to the belief that the lower uh, summer returns are attributed to vacation behavior of managers who tend to reduce their risks because they want to travel and enjoy the summer. On the other hand, the Halloween effect uh, proponents would probably argue that there are not lower return during summer, but the, it's, it's the higher return during the last quarter of the month which is caused by abnormal expectations of an abnormal optimism of market participants uh, in the end of the last quarter towards the next year. Um, the more recent work related to sell in May um, is, is, is kind of different from both of these explanations. Uh, a recent paper by Chen and Marsh uh, actually attributes this effect to political risk. So they say uh, this slump in the summer, or I guess excess return in the last quarter of the year has nothing to do with vacations or abnormal expectations for the, for the upcoming year. It, it has to do with removal of political uncertainty um, following the US elections. So they find that most of the effect uh, most of the abnormal returns occur in election years, in particular midterm election. Uh, the third effect we addressed in our paper was the January effect. This hasn't been much discussed recently, and there's a reason for it. Uh, when we looked at the January effect, we found that most of the abnormal return in January is in fact observed in the very few days of January, or you can even see the very last few days of December. So we conclude that the January effect is really just a turn of the month effect that happens in January, and we didn't see anything um, in excess of that. The last effect is the weekend effect. Uh, when it, it's been observed um, that Monday returns tend to be lower than the rest of the week's return. And, and we did look at this effect um, in our paper, and, and we did observe that the Monday returns were statistically significantly lower than the rest of the week. And we did some robustness checks and analyzed the surrounding days. And at the end of our study, uh, we concluded, yes, yes, we do see some evidence of Monday returns being lower than the rest of the week returns. But if we wanted to build a trading strategy around this, uh, we would have to 
incur a weekly turnover of the portfolio of at least 100%. So we thought the effect was not strong enough to offset uh, the associated trading costs. So also we, we observed the effect, but we didn't really find a lot of value in it from a practitioner's standpoint. The second type of uh, anomalies uh, would be these announcement drifts, pre-announcements or post-announcement drifts. And a lot of the traditional or, or a lot of the literature uh, actually deals with uh, earnings announcements or other stock level announcements. And as I mentioned, we focus on S&P 500 as the aggregate. Uh, so we wanted to look at slightly different types of announcements. So we examined a number of US macro announcements in our research, for example, we were looking at inflation or unemployment announcements. And we didn't see a, a lot of value in, in many of these US macro announcements, but there was one uh, that stood out and that's the Federal Open Market Committee uh, pre-announcement drift. So this, this effect has been described in a paper by Luca and Mensch. Um, and essentially, uh, Federal Open Market Committee is the monetary policy-making body of Federal Reserve. And um, as the paper describes, they schedule eight meetings per year. Uh, and so the committee meets. The meeting always starts on Tuesday. Uh, they discuss uh, economic and financial conditions of the U.S. market. And then on Wednesday at 2 p.m. Eastern, they announce um, any changes in policy and they announce what kind of short-term rates they're going to be targeting. And um, the paper posits that um, risk-averse investors tend to reduce their holdings prior to the announcement because they don't want to face the uncertainty surrounding the announcement. So there's value to investors who are willing to bear the risk so they can uh, trade by the market before the announcement and, and carry it through um, and, and uh, gain excess returns. So the, the work we did, so the original paper focused more on the intraday drift, uh, trading a couple hours before the announcement. And what we wanted to do, we also wanted to see what kind of value can an investor gain uh, if the investor only trades at the end of the day and only rebalances uh, once a day. Uh, the last type of anomaly, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time introducing momentum. Uh, I'm sure you all know, and I'm sure you all have all read a lot of work about momentum uh, and excess return related to momentum. The only difference I would point out is that once again, we are focused on uh, the aggregate US market. So the traditional, a lot of the momentum strategies pick like a top decile and like the lowest decile of stocks and, and build this long, short portfolio, but that's not our case. All, all we look at is the momentum of the aggregate market, and then we trade um, with the direction of momentum. Okay, so, so now in the next section, we're gonna be building some very simple uh, trading strategies, and this is a general note that applies to all the different trading strategies I will discuss throughout this webinar. Um, so first of all, um, we will refit all the parameters for all our models at the end of every year and then hold the parameters steady for, for the next year. And the way we do it, we, we build these walk forward simulations. So if our data begins in 1960, our first fitting window will be from 1960 to 1970. And at the end of 1970, we will fit all our parameters uh, and then hold them constant through 1971. So for 1971, we can build these uh, out sample predictions from all our models and store them. And at the end of 1971, we expand our in sample window. So now the window is from 1960 through 1971. Again, we fit all our models, store our parameters and use these trading parameters to produce forecasts for 1972. And what we accomplish by building this walk forward simulation is that we have a more realistic uh, view of how the strategy might perform. Because if we only fit all the parameters in sample, we would be introducing a lot of uh, forward looking bias, which we want, which is what we want to avoid um, if, if we want to have a realistic idea about how the strategy might do in the future. Um, so most of our signals will be binary. We will simply be flat, 
invested in a risk-free asset or uh, we will be slightly leveraged. Um, we will be 150% long the market. Um, there is no particular significance to the choice of 150%. Uh, some, of, some of the choice of the signal bounds between zero and 150 is legacy. I was replicating the signal bounds from our previous paper, uh, the one month model. And some of it is a little bit of practicality. Um, and we will discuss this more once we see the results. Uh, but you will see that in order to gain a little bit of extra return and extra volatility, um, it's desirable to be able to be a little bit leveraged. And then 150% is a level of leverage that's available to the average retail investor. So we wanted to stay in some kind of reasonable bounds. And then in terms of our optimization objective function for the purposes of this paper, uh, whenever we said we picked a set of optimal parameters, we that means that we picked a set of parameters that maximized our sharp ratio. So again, in reality, this you know this might be slightly different. There might be different return or volatility targets. Um, but for as I said, for the purpose of this paper, it's general, it's relatively concave and simple. So we'll just stick to that. So the first strategy we built was the turn of the month strategy. Um, and the only two parameters that come into play are the start date and end date. So as I described this walk forward simulation, uh, now you can see the results of the parameters of the walk forward simulation. So the start date is generally between zero and minus three. So zero means we would only be long during the very last day um, of the month. And, and minus three means that we would actually enter the long position three days before the last day of the month. The end date um, initially is about five and then it drops to three and then stays uh, at three through the end of the walk forward. And the end date is when we sell the position back. So three means that's three days after uh, the beginning of next month and then five days mean that's five days. The cell in May is very similar, uh, but just one note. So in, in this simulation, I actually followed Terry Marsh's paper uh, on political uncertainty and only uh, picked the winters following midterm election. But um, I also tested the version when we trade every year and it didn't make a huge difference. I just kind of liked the political uncertainty explanation. So again, the two parameters that we have to optimize for are the start date and end date. Uh, so, so this is kind of reversed from the turn of the month. So for us, the start date is the date when we sell our position. And then uh, the end date is the date when we go back to the market. So essentially, if you flip it around, you can say we buy um, on September 1st of the uh, midterm election year and then sell uh, the following April. And you can see the parameters were pretty stable throughout the uh, simulation for both start date and end date. For the FOMC strategy, there's really not much to optimize. Um, you know, it's a strategy that trades eight times per year. So, so, so the sample is so small, there's really not a lot of magic. But what we were interested in seeing is whether or not we should extend the holding period uh, from just using the day before or whether we should go two days before, just in case people have been um, exploiting this anomaly and maybe the drift has moved forward. But we didn't see evidence of that. You can see the fifth line, that's the one day ahead S&P index and, and the premium on that day is pretty small. So in the end, we, we stuck to just the one day trade. So if the announcement comes out on Wednesday, we enter the long position Tuesday at the close, and then we hold the long position through Wednesday and sell out uh, at the close on Wednesday. And then the first few rows in the paper, we discussed some of the original findings of the paper, uh, which focused on some intraday trades. So that's, that's all there was. So for the state dependent momentum, there's a couple different uh, momentum strategies people have deployed. And to be honest with you, it doesn't really make a huge difference whether you use a simple 200-day moving average or whether you use um, 
some kind of enhancement. For, for this paper, we picked this, a two-state predictive regression model. Um, and as you can see in, in the formula, uh, what we do, we build this indicator of what we call the good time or bad time, um, which is defined as the 200-day moving average. So if the S&P 500 price, it's above its 200-day moving average, we call it uh, the good state. And when it's below, we call it the bad state. And then we have this ZT is a predictor of market return. And in our case, it's, it's a simple 12-month return of the market. And so we use this uh, state indicator and this market predictor to forecast next month um, return. So pretty straightforward. And I will actually show you in the next slide. Um, you know, I was saying that it doesn't make a huge difference what kind of momentum strategy you use. And, and you can see I compared a 200 day simple moving average strategy and the SDM, that's the state dependent momentum strategy. And if you can follow the plots, they, they look pretty similar. You can see the SDM um, maybe has slightly smoother performance, uh, but in terms of return, uh, they're pretty similar. Uh, so this plot also shows the rest of the strategies we discussed. And I, th I think just, you know, looking at this plot, we're starting to see some preliminary results. So what we see that a lot of these strategies have a smoother performance relative to buy and hold, but all of them have a really hard time keeping up with buy and hold. And in more specific numbers, this shows um, the performance statistics of the individual models. So you can see in terms of returns, uh, the turn of the month uh, in the state dependent momentum uh, do the best job of keeping up with return of buy and hold. But that's kind of obvious because when you look at, they also have the highest market beta. So it's it's kind of easier for them to keep up. So when you look at the FOMC strategy, that's the strategy that only trades eight times per year. Uh, it's, it's kind of interesting. So it has the lowest return um, and the lowest sharp ratio of the strategies that we built. But if you look at the risk return ratio, it's actually the highest. So this strategy um, does offer some unique alpha, but it's it's really hard to argue that this would be an alternative to buy and hold simply because it misses out um, on, on so much of the return. But what you can see um, kind of the benefit of, of missing out is that there's a significant reduction in volatility um, and max drawdown and time of the water. In, in fact, all of the strategies reduce volatility and drawdown and time underwater relative to buy and hold. And the, the one thing that I didn't address until now, but definitely comes to play uh, when you look at this performance is the level of leverage. So I, I sort of arbitrarily chose 150, which places me wherever we are now, but depending on what your risk tolerance is and, and what's your position on leverage, if, if your goal was to outperform um, the return of buy and hold and you had leverage available, you could simply scale up these signals and, and get outperformance in both uh, sharp ratio and return. Um, so, so, but as you kind of to conclude on this table, the reason why we didn't stop the paper here is that all of this outperformance, I, I guess you can see some of it and, and the SDM looks the most promising in terms of sharp, but it's really hard to tell which model to pick and, and would we really have the confidence to stick to just one of the models? So instead, what we do um, for the rest of the paper, we are going to combine these signals and see if we can get a signal that's more robust um, and uh, outperforms buy and hold uh, more consistently. So there are a couple different ways how we can combine these signals. So a very simple weight would be to use the equal weight portfolio. So essentially we would add a 25% weight to each of the signals and every day we would just add up these signals uh, into a combined signal. The second option is to not use equal weights but use some kind of a optimal weight um, derived from a mean variance optimization. The drawdown of 
this approach is that the mean variance optimization relies on having a good sigma estimate. And sigma is the covariance matrix of the returns of our strategies. So if you have a really short history or if there's uncertainty um, about you know, the, co the stability of these signals, uh, we may not have a lot of confidence in sigma. And both of those approaches, the equal weight and mean variance optimization, um, we also worry that if we cap our signals at 100, we know that some of these strategies don't trade very often. We know the sell in May only trades once every four years, and we know that FOMC only trades eight times per year. So we worry as, as a money manager that you have a significant capital underutilization if you use these two algorithms without any additional adjustment. Um, so there's two options which you can do. You can either scale up uh, these two approaches, or you can build some kind of algorithm that offers a little bit of extra scaling. Uh, and this was the optimizing uh, of the signal combination. So essentially what we did, uh, we built a simple grid search algorithm. So we created this grid um, of, of weights. So every model can get weights between zero and 100. And we perform sort of a walk forward with these grids. And at the end of every refit, we, we pick the set of optimal weights. And by optimal, again, I mean the, the set of weights that optimizes sharp ratio. And what's different is that now I'm not capped at 100% weight, uh, but I only cap my final signals between 0 and 150. And we'll see what this does. Um, so these are the optimal weights from the mean variance optimization. Um, and I wouldn't necessarily worry about the early years too much. As I said, the, the sigma estimate is probably not that great. So I, I wouldn't necessarily make a lot of conclusions about the state-dependent momentum taking up all the weights in 1980. But we see in, in the more recent history, um, each of the model gets a certain amount of weight. And it looks like more recently, um, the FOMC model gets the highest weight of about 45%. Um, the state dependent momentum gets about 30%. Sell in May gets about 15 and turn of the month gets about 10%. In contrast, this was the signal combination algorithm. And I threw in buy and hold in, in this case, just to see if that ever gets picked as the optimal strategy and it kind of never gets picked. But it was curious to see. So now this, this may be a little confusing because you see these weights of you know, 200 and 300%. Um, but as I said, so we take these unconstrained weights, multiply them by the individual signals, but then we cap the final signal between zero and 150. So the two models uh, have the same bounds and, and so does the equally weighted portfolio. Uh, so now this slide shows the performance of all three approaches that I just discussed. One of the most entertaining thing whenever I run these tests is to see how difficult it is to outperform the uh, equally weighted portfolio, especially in, in terms of sharp. So we see this one has the highest sharp of 0.85, but um, the mean variance optimized sharp of 0.81 is, is pretty close. Um, so if you look at the equal weight, even though it has the highest sharp, it may not be the most desirable strategy because it has a significantly lower return than buy and hold. Um, but uh, the good news about the model, it has about a third of the volatility of buy and hold. So depending on what's your risk preference, this may or may not be a, a good strategy. The optimized, uh, the mean variance optimized strategy is very similar in terms of return. Um, and has just a slightly higher volatility, uh, which is the reason why the sharp ratio is a little bit lower. And what's nice about both of these is they significantly reduce the time underwater and the max drawdowns of buy and hold. So the optimized signal strategy um, doesn't have the greatest sharp, but what's interesting, it kind of does address the issue of, of maybe better capital utilization because we see that one has the highest return. So it does the best job of uh, keeping up uh, with buy and hold in terms of return. So realistically, even though we did show um, the signal optimized strategy with 
the grid the grid search algorithm a lot of times what we do in production uh, would be instead of using this grid search we would do one more step of optimization and we would build a scaling factor for for example the mean variance to optimize because you can see that if you scale up the mean variance optimized portfolio you could easily outperform the optimized signal <clears throat> but i kind of wanted to keep it relatively simple for the purposes of this paper so i didn't want to add another layer of complication and spend a lot of time discussing what the scaling should be because the scaling ultimately depends on um, a risk preferences b uh, availability of leverage and 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 c um, whatever the target is if we need to stay close to the benchmark if we need to target certain volatility so there's a lot uh, that may influence the scaling setup the one metric that we always pay a lot of attention to when we build models is the max drawdown. Um, and so for example, for I will focus on the signal optimized model for a little bit because it had the highest drawdown. Um, and the reason why we spend a lot of time looking into drawdown is that investors really dislike drawdowns and for many obvious reasons. But what's also important, it's not just the size of the drawdowns, it's, it's also the timing of the drawdowns. So, of course, it's important to have small drawdowns, but we, if we want to minimize our investors' suffering, we would also like to have the drawdowns relatively uncorrelated to the drawdowns of the market. And this was kind of good news about the seasonal and trend model, uh, because we see that some of the larger drawdowns uh, occur in different times than the largest market drawdown. So the largest drawdown of 25.75% actually occurs in 1998 and lasts for about a year. Um, and uh, the largest market drawdowns don't occur until 2002 or 2008. And we see that in 2002, uh, the model has about 18% drawdown, 17.89, which is definitely much better than the 40. 4% drawdown of the market. And in 2008, the drawdown is less than 10%. So that's definitely uh, pretty desirable. So to conclude a little bit about the individual seasonal and trend model, the results are a little bit mixed. So we really like the sharp ratio potential. We like the drawdowns. We like the volatility. We like the time underwater reduction. But in order to compete with returns of buy and hold, uh, this requires leverage. And so depending on how much leverage there is available to us, you know, that may or may not be uh, feasible to outperform buy and hold in terms of return. So for the rest of this webinar, I will take this one step further and I will uh, put the SATM model in context with our other research. Um, so there's several reasons why I may want to combine different forecasts and, and this slide summarizes a lot of the motivation behind that. So for example, um, some of the models may have relatively short track record. And as I pointed out when we discussed the mean variance optimization, if we try to optimize the set of weights between models, this short track record may lead to significant parameter, uh, parameter uncertainty. Also, uh, different models may have state-dependent performance. So what I mean is um, a lot of the traditional market timing models tend to do really well, tend to be contrarian and do really well in market turmoil, but they're not necessarily very good at keeping up with the rallies. But uh, state-dependent momentum or momentum models in general uh, do a pretty good job of keeping up with the rallies and offer some tail risk protection um, in the terminal as well. So we can kind of enhance and smooth our performance but by combining different types of model. Also a well-described phenomenon is alpha decay. And especially if we're talking about anomalies and if we're not really sure why they exist, we kind of always have to assume that they can go away anytime. And there have been a lot of successful examples in, in different areas um, of business. Uh, there's been a lot of successful ensembling in economic forecasting, um, in the 
sports forecasting. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you guys all remember the Kaggle challenge when people were forecasting Netflix uh, preferences. And I think the winning model was an ensemble of dozens, if not hundreds of models. So there's definitely uh, some evidence of successful combination of models. So in terms of what are the ideal candidates for combining, um, ideally we're looking for models that use different information sets or forecast at different horizons. Um, you know, one day, one month, six months, you name it. Also what's helpful or what we have found helpful was combining models uh, that use different modeling approaches. So I have a couple minutes left. Uh, so I'll quickly run through the other two models that I will combine the SATM with. Uh, so the first one was the six month model. Uh, it was published in the Journal of Portfolio Management last March. The title is A Practitioner's Defense on Return Predictability. And it uses a number of well-known um, Academ well-known factors used in academic literature. And you can see from this list that these are all macro and fundamental factors um, such as inflation and price ratios. So the, by price ratios, we mean like dividend to price, earnings to price, book to market. Uh, we use consumption, um, lending conditions, et cetera. Um, and then what we did was we built a simple least square regression. And because we were using overlapping data, we used correlation screening um, as, a, as a variable selection procedure. And we used this model to forecast six month equity risk premium. And the second model uh, that I will show some results for in just a second is available on SSRN. Uh, it's called Return Predictability and Market Timing, a one month model. And again, you see this, this model uses a number of macro and fundamental variables. Um, some, of, some of the variables are the same as or similar as the ones from the six month model, such as inflation, new orders, new shipments, Baltic dry index. And there's a number of new predictors, such as industrial production, slope of the term structure, housing starts, just to name a few. Um, so this model, as the, as the title suggests, forecasts one month equity risk premium. And uh, it also uses a regression, but in this model, we chose a weighted least squares regression uh, with stepwise with AIC as this variable selection criteria. And if this model sounds interesting at all, um, it will actually be my topic at QuantCon in April. So if you wanna hear more about the one month model, please join me in New York, it will be fun. Um, but so without going too much detail about these models, I'll just fast forward um, to uh, the signal combination results. So this slides, the first three columns show the performance of the three individual models. And now uh, just a heads up, the time frame is a little different. Uh, this is only from 2003 to 2016. And even though we have a pretty long backtest for the seasonal and trend model, we have shorter backtests for the one month and six month model. So that's why the, the window is shorter. So what do we see when we compare the individual models? Uh, we see that the sharp ratios are pretty comparable in the ballpark of one, uh, but the SATM has a, has a lower uh, return and lower alpha. And again, I'm kind of avoiding the issue of scaling, um, but but that definitely comes to play uh, in in this um, in this setup. And, and just a side note, the, the reason why I've been kind of circumventing the uh, scaling and the optimal bet size discussion, it's not because we think it's boring. We actually think it's very interesting but I, I would prefer to address it in like a more comprehensive way. So I don't wanna uh, you know, spend another hour just discussing the scaling of the model. So for the purpose of this discussion, I will just leave it as is. Uh, one thing that this table does not show are the correlation of the SATM model with the one month and the six month. And they're actually pretty low. Um, the correlation with the six month model is about 27% and the correlation with the one month is about 56. So that alone suggests that there might be some value in combining the two. Um, the fourth column com 
just shows an equally weighted combination of the one month and six month model. Uh, so you can see you can definitely um, improve your performance by just combining the one month and six month model alone. The sharp ratio goes from you know, 0.95 and 0.102 to about 0.1.19. And then in the fifth column, that's actually not a typo. Um, I did just added the three models and divided it by two, not three. And the reason why I did it, I kind of wanted to keep the volatility uh, between the two combinations relatively similar. And I didn't want to get into a lot of discussions about the scaling again. But um, the takeaway is kind of visible. Uh, we see that we do improve our sharp ratio further by including the seasonal and trend model. So we go from 1.19 to 1.27. And we see, you know, we further improve uh, the time underwater, uh, which is now, you know, less than a, uh, you know, less than a quarter of that of buy and hold. Uh, and we still reduce the volatility of buy and hold, but now we exceed uh, the return pretty handily. Um, as in the previous uh, performance analysis, I will drill down a little bit on the drawdowns. Uh, so we see the drawdowns of this combined model are 14.51%. And, and this next slide actually shows the drawdowns of all the individual models um, and the combined model as well. It may not be as clear to see, but if you if you look at the one month model drawdown and the six month model drawdown, you already see that they don't occur exactly at the same time. And then we did have a closer look at the combined models drawdown. So all in all, we see the maximum drawdown of 14.51% actually occurs in 2010, which is well after the market has rebounded from uh, the worst crisis. So we see that the drawdown um, during the financial crisis of 2009, the maximum drawdown we recorded was 12.78%, which is a pretty good improvement over the 55% um, of, uh, of the buy and hold drawdown. So all in all, um, aside from the improvement in SHARP, also the drawdown improvements make an appealing argument about why we would want to include some of these seasonal anomalies into our market timing ensemble. So in conclusion, um, the SATM model uh, may not be super strong on its own, uh, even though it definitely does uh, improve uh, the risk adjusted performance um, of, of an investor previously just holding buy and hold. But it does have a place in the market timing ensemble model uh, because it enhances performance of traditional uh, forecasting models. And that's about all I wanted to say because I want to leave enough time for questions. Um, but if you want to follow our models, we published this daily report, which you can subscribe to, and you can see how all our different models are doing. Or you can check out our blog or follow us at, at Hull Tactical to, to see what we're up to. And, and see more about what kind of research we're currently doing. Um, so I want to thank my colleagues, Alex, Rick, and Blair for their data and their help. Um, and here's a brief message from our compliance. And in the meantime, I think this is a good time to switch and open the forum to some questions. Um, so yep. Thank you, Petra. Um, we are going to switch over to questions now. So if you have already submitted a question, um, Petra will, will get to work answering that. And if you still have a question that you want answered, you can put it in the questions box at the bottom of the GoToWebinar platform, and hopefully we will get to it. So mm -hmm. if you want to just go ahead on those questions, Petra. Sure, so I'll start from the top. So the first question is, any chance this working paper is available online? So right now it isn't, uh, but we will be publishing it on SSRN uh, probably in the next week or next two weeks. So it will be available online very soon. Um, second question, 
can you list each software you have used to build your model, please? So uh, everything that we have done to this point um, and all the plots and all the results were generated using R. Uh, we use a little bit of Python for some of our data collection, but we do all our modeling using R. Um, so the f another question, have you split your data set into training and testing to validate these models? So we do. So when we build this uh, walk forward, uh, we build these tests and the training and testing uh, in kind of uneven way. So we always have, you know, as I said, our training window is expanding. It starts with 10 years and then we grow it every year. And then our testing window is always like the subsequent year of the model. So it's it's we do, but it's 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 a little more continuous. Um, so another good question: Have you thought about applying the Black Litterman approach to portfolio optimization? Yes, and as I said, I did. This was a little bit beyond the scope of this paper. Um, but that's a very good point, and that's definitely, in my opinion, the way to proceed uh, because a lot of a lot of the issues with just picking one um, simple mean variance optimization model. Uh, oh, I should have mentioned. Oh, this is a good question. Do you take transaction costs and trading fees into account? Uh, yes we do so uh, we did not take out any management fees but we did take out transaction fees and the assumption we made on transaction fees we assumed uh, transaction fees of 2.5 basis points um, for every trade uh, where was your raw data sourced um, so there's not a whole lot of data that goes into this specific model uh, we get our data from bloomberg and uh, you know all the calendar and seasonal anomalies uh, you know that's pretty straightforward doesn't require any external data and then if you were referring to the other models um, I think we describe all the different data sources in the two papers so I won't go into the details but majority of the data is from Alfred uh, whenever we use any macro data we try to use um, unrevised point in time data. So that's why we refer to Alfred. And then we get a lot of our data from Bloomberg as well. Right, so there was another good question. Um, on the combining slide with the SATM and the six month model, how do the combined results look from 1970 to 2005? And that's the issue because the six month model, um, we only have data going back to 1990 and we use the first 10 years to estimate the first in sample. So we only start making out sample forecast in 2001. So sadly, we do not have the combination of the, of the models. Uh, between 1970 and 2001. In terms of another question is, are you using any risk models to improve the Sharpe ratio? And the simple answer is we do not. Um, so typically because we forecast S&P 500, the S&P 500 index is a pretty well diversified product. So we don't overlay our alpha model with um, with additional risk models. Um, yeah, and then the next question was the uh, why one month plus six month plus SATM divided by two div instead of one month plus six month plus SATM divided by three. Um, so essentially what would have happened if I had divided by three, uh, the Sharpe ratio would stay about the same and just the return and the volatility would be lower uh, but then I would be significantly lower than, than the previous version. So, so it wouldn't be um, as obvious to see the improvement in return because when I just divided it by two, I had the volatilities like within one percentage point of each other. Um, 
and then the return was uh, was higher. So in, in practice, we, we wouldn't do either divided by two or divided by three. We would have a slightly more sophisticated algorithm to show the weights, but the point of this table was just to um, show a simple comparison of what happens when we just add the SATM to the mix. So I know uh, that was a little confusing, but um, I was trying to keep it as simple as possible. Um, another question um, says, an anomaly in volatility could be a good predictor of returns. Have you considered that in your model? In fact, we have. So we built, so in our existing models, we built some, um, uh, some, some VRP models. So, so uh, volatility risk premium, we typically defined as the difference between implied and realized volatility. And we have found that there are some anomalies related to, um, to this difference. And we have built some models and we're using them. I did not talk about them uh, as an anomaly. That, that's, a, that's a different category of models that we use. But I agree with, uh, uh, with you. There's definitely a value in modeling uh, volatility. Um, so this is a good question. How did the model perform during February's Volpocalypse? I like the name Volpocalypse. So the model suffered um, a little bit of drawdown. I think the drawdown was about 5%, which was um, in line with the broad market drawdown. Um, but, um, you know, the model was not immune to, to the Volpocalypse in this case. But the 5% drawdown is about in line with, with what we expect. Uh, given the back, does it? It's not out of line to suffer something like that. Um, so I think that's all the questions we have. Petra, are you all set on your end? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Great. I think so. Um, so if you still do have a question and you want Petra to answer it, you can email it to us at um, events at quantopian.com and we'll do our best to get an answer to you. I want to thank Petra for a wonderful presentation. And if you enjoyed her talk, you can check out quantcon.com, learn more about her upcoming talk at quantcon. And um, as I said earlier, this webinar was recorded and we will be sending out um, the recorded version in an email within the next few days. So thank you everyone for joining and thanks Petra. Thank you everyone. Take care.